We are at a very awkward time in the relationship between the cannabis plant and humans. We've been using cannabis for health and spirituality for millennia, and yet because of the last 80 years or so of prohibition, modern generations barely know the plant at all. As a society, we are going to have to go through a process of relearning how to use the plant, how best to grow and hybridize her for medicine, and of course we are going to have to undo all of the reefer madness fed to us by the U.S. government and institutional players like pharmaceutical companies and law enforcement. Now that prohibition is unraveling in the U.S., we have stopped strong-arming other nations to fight cannabis in their own countries, too, and now their freedoms are increasing. Ukraine, Mexico, Colombia, Costa Rica, the Czech Republic, and many more countries have varying forms of cannabis freedom, and it is spreading globally at a fast rate now that the U.S. has stopped bullying everybody. Of course, there is Portugal, too, who shocked the world and legalized all drugs in 2001 and has seen an addiction drop by 50% and violent crime rates drop, too, not to mention everyone is much happier. (laughs) What we do not yet have in the U.S. are updated social mores for how to talk to each other about cannabis, how to think about cannabis as medicine, and how to build a business model for distribution that will work to the benefit of all. Sure, in the cannabis activist scene, we have much of this figured out for today, but as more and more humans bring cannabis into their lives, what is accepted socially will all change again and again. Today's guest is Dr. Sunil Agarwal. He is a medical geographer and a leading expert in cannabis medicine and cannabinology. He is often a panelist and speaker at top cannabis medicine conventions all over the world. Cherry-picking his accomplishments to describe him to you was really hard because he's done so much. Right now, he is a palliative medicine physician and associate hospice medical director at MultiCare Auburn Medical Center in Washington State. He received both a PhD and an MD from the University of Washington, where he now teaches. He also has degrees in chemistry, philosophy, and religious studies. As a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow, he wrote a PhD dissertation entitled The Medical Geography of Cannabinoid Botanicals in Washington State, Access, Delivery, and Distress, conducted under NIH first-issued federal certificates of confidentiality. Dr. Agarwal successfully led the effort to get the American Medical Association to call for a review of the scheduling classification of cannabis in 2009, their first such statement in 72 years. He serves on the editorial advisory board of the National Cancer Institute's PDQ Cancer Cam Information Summary on Cannabis and Cannabinoids. Finally, he is associate member of the Humboldt Institute for Interdisciplinary Marijuana Research and the New York Academy of Medicine, an honorary trustee of the Medicinal Cannabis Foundation of India, and vice president of the Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. And that's not even half of his bio. It's an honor to have Dr. Sunil Agarwal on Shaping Fire. So for today, let's look at the big picture. Let's go back, way back, and consider the historical roots of cannabis and humans. We will go back 30,000 years and page through the story of the love affair between humans and a plant named Cannabis Sativa. Welcome to the show, Sunil. Hey, it's great to be here, Shango. I really appreciate you making the time to join us today. So I want to start at the very beginning. You know, at the Green Flower Medical Cannabis Summit, you were painting a really wonderful image of perhaps how cannabinoids came into existence like 38 million years ago as a protective response to the increasing UV radiation from the sun. I really enjoyed hearing that. Would you go ahead and share that perspective with us again right now? Oh yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, that this was something that I, I read in some uh, you know a, a geography book that has come out nicely recently from a University of New Mexico professor, and um, really just trying to understand the deep history of cannabis uh, biogeographically, where it evolved and when it evolved, and you know so it's uh, just because part of what we what people have lost is a connection of cannabis to the the natural world, the biosphere, like the web of life that we're all part of. And um, that was kind of the context I was giving that uh, that history. And when I spoke at the at the summit, uh, trying to make that illegal uh, alien nature of cannabis back to like, hey, you know, this is part of reintegrating it back into our sense of, of, of Earth. So, you know, the this this advanced wind pollinated plant that we know now is, you know, cannabis with two sexes and occasionally hermaphrodites, it evolved in a part of the world, central, south, southern Asia. 
based on you know archaeological evidence based on on genetic evidence and you know the interesting thing is that it evolved in a place that actually at the same time it was evolving um it was also evolving in a place that was getting higher and higher elevation every year because it came at a time when the earth itself was going through a radical transformation um, whereby at that time the Indian subcontinent actually had not joined Asia. Uh, and there was a period of time about 50 million years ago when uh, it, uh, that plate collided with the Asian landmass and you had the formation of the Himalayan mountain range. Um, and that was, uh, you know, one of the, 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 as you know, the tallest mountain range in the world. And, and there at the same time, you have this cannabis plant um, that's uh, evolving in the same time. And um, how do you survive in a place where, you know, uh, every year the elevation is getting higher and higher uh, as a plant? And um, one theory is that uh, it has to create chemicals um, to protect itself from the damaging effects of ultraviolet radiation. I really and, uh, like, oh, sorry, go ahead. You know, and that's, a, that's, that's what it is. And, and that's just, a, you know, it's not just ter- cannabinoids, are, uh, but terpenes, but cannabinoids especially have these very nice properties. So that's, a, that's what, uh, what probably w- one of the theories, you know. <laughs> I, and I was really attracted to that story because, you know, it, it really respects the plant itself as having its own life story because we always talk about what the plant can do for us. But but really, the, the plant itself has its own story and, you know, it eventually comes in contact with humans and, and we start to cultivate it and it starts to influence us and then we start to influence it. But, but it's got its own storyline as well. And I think that's a great place to start. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, you're absolutely right. You know, it has to, it's, it's, it evolved, it has to survive, and it, it did a very, very good job. It, it thrived, and it ev- adapted, and um, that's part of, I think, how uh, why it is so hardy uh, and able to adapt in so many places, because it, it, it kind of has this cauldron of great stress under which it, it was formed. So, you know, um, you know, most people don't see cannabis as being the long-term cure that we've always used, you know, except for maybe the last 80 years or so. They don't really think about that, uh, you know, cannabis was a central com- uh, component of the modern pharmacopoeia, but also that, that we humans have been interacting with this plant for tens of thousands of years. Um, I know you like to talk about, you know, the place that the plant has, um, you know, in human history. Will you walk us through? the human relationship with cannabis over the ages to to put the modern prohibition in context <laughs> oh and certainly it's a <clears throat> it's quite a vast and long story so um a- anything uh, can i say in this short time will not do full justice but uh i mean you know i i guess, I guess the place to start really is is that it it um you know where it evolved in that part of the world is where people started you know first coming into contact with it and domesticating it um you know in south asia where my ancestors are from um 18,000 years ago you've got uh, that's the earliest dating of of signs of domestication of cannabis uh there could have been some uh, other records um in earlier places earlier times in that same region but you know that at that time uh uh, you know, we don't know, but the earliest writings that we get uh, from uh, from that civilization uh, that reference cannabis, um, it's very much in the context of uh, healing, which is not distinct from spiritual growth, spiritual development, and the idea that uh, you know you can't uh, that the two are separate uh, in uh, is is kind of a modern fallacy, I guess you can say. And in those days, there's really no distinction between the idea of, um, you know, achieving certain states of uh, spiritual development, meditative states, um, states of self-awareness, uh, states of uh, peace, tranquility, and a sense of healing, which is, you know, pretty tra- transformative and fundamental to to cure. I mean, if you, if, if, if disease is it comes from the word dis-ease, not to not be at ease, and you have something that's potentially part of you know putting people at peace. Uh, that's that's a kind of the fundamental stamping out of disease is where where it came or disease is where it uh, came into play. But um, certainly also it was seen um, in the development of uh, Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, traditional medicine systems, such as uh, there are systems called Unani and Tibi, um, which kind of came from Persia. Um, 
and um, uh, have other historical influences. And cannabis found homes in those, traditional Chinese medicine, cannabis found a home. There's the suggestions from the Ebers Papyrus, which is uh, the one of the oldest medical documents that we have, which comes from uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, there are um, formulas for the use of cannabis, and, and there it's much more you know, analgesic, uh, much dealing with relieving pressure in the eyes or pain in the eyes. Um, so uh, it it still had a dual role, both in the spiritual realm and in kind of a um, dealing with pain, dealing with uh, problems of inflammation. And um, I guess uh, over the ages, uh, that uh, that this, uh, this cannabis spread through the parts of the world where those forms of me- systems of medical practice were were used: Chinese medicine, Unani medicine, Persian medicine, Indian medicine. Um, they 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 went around in the ancient world, um, and I think. Um, you know, in, uh, there was there was early writings of the use in prevention of seizures uh, from uh, much older times in Syria, and there's a, the the first citations that. Um, the uh, like if you look at the government of India, it has a traditional knowledge library, digital library, where they're trying to record all the traditional uses of plants and things in their in their heritage, so that they don't get scooped up by big companies that say, oh, we came up with that first or something. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're trying to establish prior art. They um, make reference to, I believe it's a 12th century textbook um, uh, by a guy named. Um, Ibn um, uh, Ib- Ibn Sina. I- Ibn Sina. He has different names depending on which part of the world you're in. But this guy's textbook of medicine from that time, from the sort of the Arabic um, Renaissance, was uh, widely read um, all over the both the East and the West. Uh, it was taught at like Oxford and you know even in the old m- monastic uh, European traditions. So this is the citation that I think they intentionally use to show that. This this very well known Arabic uh, scholar of medicine and many other things was citing cannabis uh, and its medical uses, and it was being read both in the East and the West. So um, that that kind of was, I think, a big recognition that the most advanced forms of medicine into the Renaissance uh, and the and medieval period, you know, cannabis was part of that. I think um, the next big wave that you can say. Uh, where we finally get uh, much more uh, wider exposure in the 19th. It happens in the 19th century, uh, and and there was ongoing use in other throughout you know the centuries before between the 19th and the 12th centuries, um, and you know I don't want to go go into all this, the so many different details that we can look at with witches and and traditional herbalists in Europe and uh, indigenous uses in other parts of, the, of in Africa and other places that don't get a lot of attention, but um, I guess it's big. Uh, its big moment in the sun, so to speak, happens in the 1840s when, um, due to the British um, uh, East India Company's, um, you know, um, activities in India, uh, they are able to import into India leading medical doctors from the 19th century who were trained at the top academies of medicine in Europe in those days, which was the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And that's where you got um, uh, Dr. William O'Shaughnessy, um, who trained in Edinburgh. And really, this was a center of medical training, not just in Europe, but also people in the United States would go to train in Edinburgh in those days because there really wasn't big uh, centers in the U.S. in those times. So anyway, this doctor, who was already kind of a genius Irish doctor who had figured out the treatment of cholera, um, who nobody had ever had figured out that, oh boy, we should probably give IV fluids to cholera victims with, with electrolytes in them so that they don't dehydrate to death you know, from diarrhea. So that was his like, you know, doctoral thesis and a pretty, pretty brilliant, uh, discovery. It probably saved many lives. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he then was, he, he got a lucrative position in the British East India company. They said, we want you to go to Calcutta, which is our, where our headquarters are in India at that time, the the capital of the uh, British India. And we want you to set up a, a modern medical college, and uh, this is the oldest modern medical college in Asia now. It's still in operation, and he established it. 
and he was able to he was such a kind of polygot and uh, thoughtful man that he said hey let's let's bring in um uh let's try to develop the uh principles where we can teach in the native tongue to the native uh, indians which is great i mean they're called colonialists after all so they don't always have a high regard for native ideas but they did and he did and uh in as part of that process of establishing uh, chemistry department and the college he said you know i really need to learn the local medicines so we can kind of we don't have to import all of these from europe and we can kind of learn from them and uh, learn from indians so he started seeing the use of cannabis uh in the marketplaces the local fakirs and healers um and um he said, "Well, this is a this is an interesting compound," um, and he started experimenting with it in medical students, in animals, uh, and finally in patients. And you know, he kind of made his career, at least the first half of his career. He was such a brilliant guy that he has actually many firsts to his name. But he's he wrote a paper that um, in the 1830s that that got international currency on the use of cannabis indica or ganja, Indian hemp, um, you know, and he covered lots of different conditions, convulsions, tetanus, um, some conditions that uh, infantile convulsions and tetanus uh, and also terminal rabies. Uh, again, were conditions where there actually was no cure, but um, uh, because we didn't have, you know, modern antibiotics in those days, antivirals or, you know, inoculums, but, you um, you know, he was able to bring a lot of relief to people who otherwise would die very horrible deaths. Um, you know, and unable, unable to eat or drink because of the convulsions from uh, from terminal rabies when it gets into your nervous system, um, or severe stiffness uh, from from tetanus when it gets really advanced. Uh, and he's able to relax those muscles and allow people to eat and drink. And and of course, he did have uh, other you know younger patients who who survived convulsions. So that that kind of thing was uh, was was ex- excellent. His his discoveries really launched modern uh, the use of cannabis in modern medicine, and I think um, you know we've just had a trajectory since that time where it's um, it's come and gone, and uh, it, it achieved another peak. Um, um, really, it, it it started peaking at the late 19th century, early 20th century, leading doctors from around in, in the early 20th century. Dr. William Osler, who's the father of internal medicine, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Gower, who basically did some of the earliest studies in Parkinson's, uh, Dr. Reynolds, who first established the typology of seizures, epilepsy disorders, who was Queen Victoria's physician, all of these leading doctors, you know, founded founder of Johns Hopkins University, they all knew cannabis, and they all knew it was an important part of their armamentarium, thanks to the work of O'Shaughnessy and their own research on on it and use in their patients. So that finally, um, that era kind of came to an end in the 40s, when uh, early 40s, uh, when the you know federal it got political, and you know there was uh, increasing. Now that the United States was a colonial power, uh, this is one theory. You know, it was had taken over the Philippines. Um, it, it, they had started uh, using, you know, dealing with Mexico much more. <clears throat> they actually, you know, I think they they saw cannabis in a in a different light now, associated it with people that they were trying to control, and um, you know, it, it 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 became much more of a political football, and the the medical arts around cannabis started falling out of favor. Um, there was also a move to more industrial medicine, a little bit more pharmaceuticalized version of medicine, uh, and you know, even though there had been attempts to grow cannabis in the United States for pharmaceutical purposes, um, somehow it just didn't take. So anyway, ultimately, that um, we, we have to wait until really the 70s and 80s, and then now in the peak 90s and beyond, that now we're having this next cycle of emergence. And this time, we are much more uh, prepared and much more, uh, you know, we can learn from the history. And we now have this endocannabinoid system science that has developed uh, in the late late. Um, late uh, part of the 20th century that really changed everything. I mean, now we finally have a deeper understanding of actually on a molecular level, what are these cannabinoids that are in cannabis that evolved all those 38 million years ago? What are they doing in our human bodies? That was an epic answer, Sunil. And no wonder, no wonder you've got a dry throat. That was, that was <laughs> awesome. I'm so glad that we got that recorded. Um, the, the picture that you just painted from 38 million years ago to 
us learning about the endo, uh, endocannabinoid system in the 90s and then what's happening with modern medical marijuana. That's an epic picture you just painted. And because your answer was so full, we need to take our first short break right now. We'll be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. Using pesticides when growing cannabis has been common for a long time. Nowadays, though, we know better. We know that most pesticides formulated for food crops have never been tested for use with cannabis. They've been tested to be eaten in tiny doses. They have not been tested to be inhaled and especially not concentrated into a cannabis oil. Chemical residues from pesticides are not healthy for anyone, but they are especially dangerous for patients. For commercial cannabis growers, this has become very impactful. Cannabis enthusiasts and patients have gotten educated enough that they avoid growers who used pesticides. Not only that, but states across the country have begun making pesticide testing mandatory on all licensed cannabis crops. The time has come to find a better way to fight garden pests than covering your cannabis in chemicals. And there is a better way. Let some good bugs fight your bad bugs. Beneficial insects and predatory mites have come a long way since we were buying ladybugs online and putting them in the grow room and just hoping for the best. Natural enemies biocontrol can help you solve pest issues without using chemicals. Natural enemies founder Shane Young learned best practices from working in the ornamental plant industry and has fine-tuned those strategies specifically for large cannabis crops. Shane works with commercial cannabis clients across the country to ensure that they keep their crops safe and pest-free without the use of chemicals. Natural Enemies has proven solutions for spider mites, aphids, thrips, russet mites, broad mites, shore flies, white fly, and others too. You can rely on Natural Enemies for expertise and excellent service. For more information, go to shapingfire.com forward slash natural enemies or simply click on their banner in this week's newsletter. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Los, and our guest this week is Dr. Sunil Agarwal. So, Sunil, before the break, we were talking about how, um, you know, the medical cannabis has come to us through the ages, and now in the modern world, when we know about the endocannabinoid system, that that we are more prepared to learn about uh, the influence that this beautiful plant can have on our body. Well, you know, animal study evidence showing cannabinoids kill cancer cells started to begin to accrue in the early 70s. You know, why do you think that institutional actors like the U.S. government and especially major cancer study nonprofits aren't focusing on cannabis and talking more about it publicly and even excitedly? They just seem to be ignoring it. Yes, it's a sad thing. And given how much the leading causes of death in the country now are cancers and, um, you know, in many other parts of the world, uh, we, we really have uh, uh, are missing an incredible opportunity to um, study uh, and, and develop treatments that involve cannabis. And I think we, um, we kind of, I mean, it was starting to get in the 70s, there was a big uh, interest in funding on cannabis research uh, going on. There was a ex- interest in the national institutes. Uh, but um, you know, um, politics uh, won over. There was a, a sense, I think, that um, you know the Nixon administration uh, was like, well, we don't we, we don't really want to get that stuff out there too much because we are. I'm already using this as a tool for oppression against anti-war protesters, and um, you know, I really I, I've I've studied the Nixon tapes when where they actually uh, he talks about his motivations and he tries to. Um, fire the people who are at the world's leading medical research institute, the NIH, who uh, have argued that you know the, the restrictions are too much and there needs to you know, you know the harms have been exaggerated and you know we we should not be um, treating this like kryptonite or you know nuclear material. Um, but unfortunately, he was not that was not part of his his mission and um, I don't think that he. It was and his administration was somebody that didn't have any, um, you know, compassion for cancer patients. You can actually hear other recordings where he talks about, hey, you know, it'd be it's terrible what happens to cancer patients. They should have all the pain relief that they need. And um, you know, I, I think it's just there was just such a fundamental lack of awareness and understanding that cannabis could could offer anything of of value. Um, Beyond getting, as he talks about it, getting charged, getting buzzed, getting 
you know, that was that was the uh, the view of it that it was just this total escapist. You know, uh, it didn't have anything any serious value to it, despite the fact that you know doctors and <laughs> folks above him or smarter than him were, were were telling him otherwise. So I think that's why the re- initial research got really um, got shut down or didn't get renewed or developed. Um, there was other movements going on. Again, it was always the idea: well, cannabinoids. Who owns that? Who's going to make a bunch of money off of that? How are we going to mass supply that? In that same time, in the 70s, is when you started seeing the development of chemotherapy and modern chemotherapy. Um, and uh, you know, it was it was done in at the NIH. The first uh, use of me- what's called methotrexate to treat a certain form of uh, cancer that uh, women who get pre- are, are pregnant can get. Uh, uh, choriocarcinoma. And I mean, I think people would just, you know, they just didn't, they didn't understand how cannabinoids work. They didn't understand, um, you know, how we could <laughs> produce that in a big way because it was too much of a political football. And unfortunately, you know, we, we, we dropped that thread. Now, at the same time, there was increasing awareness in the 70s that cannabis had a role for palliation in cancer, and um, that started to start, did start to spread in multiple states, uh, Tennessee, uh, even states that today aren't medical cannabis states, like Tennessee, you know, had a cannabis, medic, a cannabis and cancer program. Uh, people figured out that it could help them with the nausea and vomiting associated with these ke- new chemotherapy drugs, and that was going on for a while, and, and then, you know, they shut that program down um, and during during, you know, in the 90s and, and when, when the uh, newer war on drugs got, got, got it going under uh, Reagan and then the first Bush. Uh, and then the AIDS patients also were trying to get in at that time, too, and that got shut down. So all of that, all of the political factors got into the way that stopped us from really moving forward on these things. And it took it took passage of California's medical cannabis law in 96 till uh to, to force the federal government to start allowing modern clinical trials research in cancer in a, a, a cancer and also in HIV, thanks to the work of Donald Abrams at UCSF. I mean, he cited the passage of the California law in his letters to the, to the National Institutes to get them to do something to, to approve his studies, which they finally did. So there was that big, long lapse. So we, we, that was kind of a dark ages period of research, and now there's been a reemergence. And unfortunately, even to this day, because of the the powers that be and the funding streams in the United States, we have not put a significant amount of resources in in the cancer uh, and uh, the cannabinologic approaches to cancer uh, area. Uh, even though there was this big moonshot initiative that the vice president just did, Joe Biden, you know, or we several of us put in suggestions to the government, you know, you need to fund this type of research. I mean, this is there's a huge promise in multiple types of cancer. Uh, it just didn't it didn't come up in their latest report as a, a priority area. They're they're looking at more, you know, they're looking at data sharing registries. They're looking at immunotherapies and all these things. Uh, again, I think there's a lot of um, you know. Uh, economic, uh, like, uh, sort of issues there that go into play. Um, but other countries are developing cancer and cannabis research. Um, you know, they did a study in Israel where they looked at the use of cannabidiol to prevent what's called graft versus host disease, which is a horrible complication of, um, a cure for cancer. So people get, um, it's called uh, stem cell transplants, uh, hematopoic stem cell transplants, and they can get cured from blood cancers, and, and they're looking at other disorders too. Um, and it's a great thing, you know, when you can kind of reset your bone marrow and blood, and, and if you had a, a fatal blood cancer like lymphoma, leukemia, you know, and you can uh, treat it and cure it with a, with a stem cell transplant. Uh, but then sometimes you can get a reaction where the uh, the graft of your, of your transplant um, attacks your own body, graft versus host disease, and it's a very severe complication. Um, you know, you get a lot of pain, weakness, stiffness, and it can make your life quality terrible. And they, and they did a phase two study where, you know, cannabidiol had a huge impact in prevention of that uh, condition in, um, um, you know, uh, in, in patients who got these stem cell transplants, 300 milligrams a day, uh, starting at a few days before transplant and until 30 days after transplant, uh, they really uh, had a huge reduction in, in the likelihood of developing the most severe forms of GBHD. That was done in Israel and Australia. Australia and I think New Zealand, they're doing more research on uh, 
cannabis uh, compounds and actual treatment of cancers. Uh, UCSF did a glioblastoma study. So I, I'm I'm seeing a renaissance. It is happening. It's going to be sl- it's slow, um, but it is it is starting in humans. And I think um, we are just keep we have to keep talking about it. We have to keep we have to do much more of it. We have to fund it more. And I think really there needs to be a lot more what's called empiric treatment trials where people we really need to collect a lot of primary data, real good quality data where people are using certain varieties with certain types of cancer. Not all cancer is the same. The idea that one size fits all is really you know not the way that cancer works. And I think um, we and I, I don't believe that cannabinoids are are you know the sole treatment for things i think that's that's really foolish cancer is such a complex condition and there's many things that can be done uh it needs to be seen as an integrated part of cancer treatment and i think um we uh we really are uh you know still very behind i'm very hopeful i think the national cancer institute um has taken on can- cannabinoids in cancer and put up a very thorough uh, review for the public and for doctors and health professionals. And that's a pretty bold move. You know, that's government funded. And that's they go through a lot of the details of the mechanisms by which cannabinoids kill cancer, which is, by the way, a very unique mechanism. Uh, you know, those, one of the, some of the problems that we have in cancer treatments is that so many other cells suffer when you're trying to kill cancer cells. And what's unique about cannabinoids is oftentimes they are very targeted. And um, that's pretty nice. You, you leave your healthy cells alone, and you um, you know target the ones that are that are causing the problems. So Sunil, you know, one thing I want to ask you before we go to break that I've always you know been curious about is that you know when I learned to what degree uh, cannabinoids can you know start to cause apoptosis and and you know stop this spread of cancer cells and and that there was something there, right? It astonished me and continues to that there are so many majorly funded cancer nonprofits that that say up front that you know we will find a cure for cancer and and we're funding all this cancer research and yet you know you don't hear about them talking about um uh, cannabis or or pushing the for cannabis or lobbying the the government and and it seems to be coming more from patients themselves and and skipping over these major nonprofits um so so if you can kind of give me a short answer before we go to commercial you know why do you think that that the that the these these large cancer nonprofits are not speaking with a louder voice to to try to push this research yeah listen they this is this is a the schedule one um status of of cannabis <coughs> marijuana really is um th- there are areas where that doesn't matter and there are areas where that really matters and i think when you when you're talking at this level of um official cancer research <coughs> it, these these things have a huge impact it really does and i think that's uh, you know uh, we, we have that's part of the fundamentalism around around cannabis that the government maintains you know schedule 1 is a type of fundamentalism uh, the idea that there is no safety under medical supervision there is no accepted medical use <coughs> and i know they're trying to talk a big game about research right now the DEA even, but um, you know the ma- maintenance of that idea is uh, so far off from what we know, and I think it's still very difficult to touch for for some of these mainstream organizations. Excuse right on. Me. That makes a lot of sense. Well, while you uh, while you take a, a drink of some water and rest your voice for a second, we're going to do another commercial. We'll be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. Look inside this crystal ball with me for a moment. I'm looking just a couple months into the future. I'm seeing the future of the Shaping Fire podcast. The show sure has grown. I've continued to interview fascinating cannabis industry luminaries, and our audience has gotten huge. It has doubled and redoubled and doubled again. There are high fives all around the Shaping Fire world headquarters. New listeners are subscribing every day and begin to listen to the back catalog of all the great interviews there. And that is where the Shaping Fire audience learns about your company. You were incredibly smart today to become an early adopter and place a commercial in Shaping Fire's early episodes. If you become an advertiser on the Shaping Fire podcast now, today, you are going to pay a fraction of the cost we'll be asking in just two months. And yet, all the audience that listens to our back catalog of interviews will hear about your company again and again. It's a great deal for you. Pay a small amount now because the show is so new. 
but take advantage of the huge listening audience we will have forever. This crystal ball is not a smoke dream. Do yourself a solid and contact us today for rates on podcast and newsletter advertising. Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out more. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and our guest this week is Dr. Sunil Agarwal. So Sunil, you know, the show so far has been so educational for me. You know, the first part of the show, we were talking about the the epic history of the plant and and our interaction with it over the centuries. And then the second part of the show, we were talking about, you know, the prohibition years and, and how the marijuana fundamentalism has still got a hold on us. But we're more prepared now to learn from the plant and how it can work with our endocannabinoid system than at any other time in human existence. And that's, you know, that's a really great message. What I'd like you to do now is, you know, open your mind's eye and imagine a future where humans are caring for their endocannabinoid system with supplementation through the use of cannabis and, you know, maybe eating uh, endocannabinoid system enhancing foods. You know, what does that society look like? What do the, what's the human health look like of those people? What's our best case scenario? Oh, sure. Well, you know, I, I think the important thing is to recognize, uh, first and foremost, uh, that there is a aspect of health, aspect of medicine, an aspect of science that is fundamentally cannabinological. You know, there is there is an, a part of our lives, uh, a part of our health that is so critically um, governed by the science of cannabinoid signaling, the science of interaction with, uh, you know, and th- through which, uh, I mean, from which uh, arised, or I mean, out of which came out of the study of cannabis. So the fundamental role that the plant cannabis and um, ha- uh, plays, but it goes beyond cannabis too, because we've, we've found cannabinoids in uh, other plants, uh, and we have our own internal cannabinoid signaling system, which is even older than cannabis itself, if you look at the evolution of that. So this is, a, this is an area I think should be called cannabinology. And, um, it, you know, I think it, it, um, it gets us to sort of recognize that, okay, well, if this is an essential part of biology that helps us regulate our homeostasis and, um, you know, it's in, involved in mood, appetite, memory, inflammation, pain perception, muscle tone, um, you know, bone growth, tumor regulation, stress, um, seizure activity, g- gastrointestinal function. Uh, I mean, th- it's it's everywhere. It's it's playing an important role. And I think we, if we recognize that, uh, then we can start to understand our health conditions a little bit more deeply, uh, trying to see if there is a, a dysregulation or problem in endocannabinoid system, either in an organ or or system-wide, that might uh, explain, like, clusters. I mean, I think Dr. Ethan Russo, uh, who I know you've interviewed before, you know, has really done a lot of great work to start thinking seriously about clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndromes. And I think there is um, there's a lot to be said for, for that when you have certain clusters around migraines, irritable, irritable bowel, fibromyalgia, endometriosis, and, and probably many more we'll start to see as we start studying on a molecular level, genetic level, you know, endocannabinoid tone, endocannabinoid deficiencies, uh, we'll get a, a finer grain understanding. And, you know, I think... Um, we was just so that part of that is starting to recognize looking at the health conditions through a cannabinologic lens and then recognizing that well there's a there's ways that we can can intervene or we can um, you know treat people cannabinologically to to make a difference to restore uh, the problems that are um, you know, the fund baseline uh, issues that are uh, impairing their health quality of life and, their, and causing symptoms and, and, and issues. And I think there's, it's not just that, it's also preventative health side too. But, you know, we, we, so that, there's two different branches. There's treatment of acute issues, and then there's pre- making sure issues don't come up. So, um, and, and, you know, making uh, wellness. So I think, um, uh, I think the, the first side of it would be where you integrate cannabinologic uh, approaches, thinking, and treatments into all branches of medicine that are relevant. I think, I think um, you know, we talked about oncology, I think uh, neurology, uh, rheumatology, um, I think those, these are some of them, and, you know, pain medicine and palliative medicine are some of the really, and, and I should also mention rehabilitation, which is my, one of my central specializations. Um, I think all of those areas are, are really ripe for um, 
having a cannabinologic uh, uh, approach. Um, and I think we, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm just so excited to think about what that would look like if we are starting to say, okay, you know, we uh, that's one approach that we are. So patients who go to clinics or you know they're looking on on their or they you know, they see their doctors or their whatever allied health professionals and they start seeing that those people recognize that maybe there's a cannabinoid problem at the basis of your oncologic, rheumatologic, et cetera, problem. So let's see if there's a way that we can boost your endocannabinoid activity, maybe with uh, some ratio of <clears throat> botanical cannabinoids, ex- whole plant extract, and let's, uh, you know, see how that do- does for you. And oh, luckily we've done some research on that with people with just your condition and we found out that, you know, a one-to-one ratio of THC to CBD in a whole plant extraction makes a big difference in terms of restoring that problem for you. I, I, you know, I, we've seen there's been research that shows in multiple sclerosis patients that they, if they take a one to one extract over time, they have they, they walk better and they have less emergency room visits. Uh, not to mention better you know pain and spasticity, and that's been in double blind placebo controlled studies. So I just you know I think it's just a matter of translating what research we do have and actually starting to roll this kind of thing out um, so that people who have these conditions um, know, uh, their, their providers know, and then the patients directly know, and there's something available for people around the corner or in their in their healthcare system where that's uh, provided for. I really believe that local medicine systems are an excellent way to go because cannabis can be produced locally and we can we can start to quantify and um, you know make varieties and preparations that everybody can understand and, and share and use. And I think ultimately you you just have a, a uh, I also believe there's a, a great therapeutic aspect on the preventative health side and the kind of complementary alternative side where you're looking at the gardens and um, growing green plants and and how people can have more interaction with that if uh, that you know makes their makes their days better their pain better their mood better uh, and I think that's a nice aspect to it and then that also dovetails into the preventative health side. Uh, what does it mean to use cannabis instead of alcohol? Or what does it mean to use cannabis as a, as a tool for yoga, meditation, spiritual pursuits, um, you know, or recreational therapy? Um, mm. what, how does that, uh, you know, how does that impact overall quality of life and um, stress, which we know is a big part of heart disease? Um, so I think that's uh, you know, some of this is so hard to to envision because uh, we just we are still stuck in this fundamentalism, which keeps us uh, keeps the relationship with cannabis really monopolized, or or better way to say olig- oligolopolized. Only a few people have a legitimate access, and I think once we recognize and actually, you know, this is a commonwealth, we all have the right to access cannabis and and also have relationships with it, not just uh, with consumption but production, and I think uh, health therapy therapeutic relationships um, should be a forefront of that. So whatever that looks like to you, um, I think um, there's a lot of areas. I I mean, I didn't even mention like infections and diabetes and, you know, heart disease, uh, stroke prevention, uh, dementia, preventing and treating dementia. There is so many exciting things that could be uh, with the cannabinoids hold promise for. And uh, I'm just... I think that future is very bright. We just, you know, we just gotta like um, collectively get off this uh, fundamentalism and, and just do it. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that picture, and I can imagine how, you know, as um, as cannabis becomes um, less stigmatized, and this research that you're talking about uh, is happening more and more, that what we're going to be seeing is, you know, a decrease of each of these different categories of human ailments and just less sickness across the board. And, uh, you know, and that's really exciting. And I'm really glad that, that you were able to take time to be on the show today to kind of uh, put it all on this long timeline so that we can really look at how uh, human health and the cannabis plant are intertwined. And I think that's where we're going to stop for today. Uh, Sunil, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's been my real pleasure, Shango. I, I look forward to uh, to hearing any feedback uh, from your listeners. And um Please check out my work at cannabinologist.org. Right on. Fantastic. And so um, you can find out more about Dr. Sunil Agarwal on his website, which is cannabinologist.org. And that's C-A-N-N-A-B-I-N-O-L-O-G-I-S-T.org.
You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and in the podcast section of the Apple iTunes Store and Stitcher. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you would leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I will be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Lose.